All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. So my name is Nick Vidal. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I just joined the OSI, uh, the Open Source Initiative, as the Community Manager for Clearly Defined. I'm two weeks into the job, so I'm still learning, and but hopefully I'll be able to share more information about Clearly Defined and also about uh, open source su supply chain uh, security as well. Uh, I'm also ser serving as the chair of the outreach committee from the Confidential Computing Consortium. This is part of the Linux Foundation and uh, so, uh, it's about confidential computing. And so it's really nice to see how we can mix these two types of technologies. So let's get started. Once I found my, all right, here it is. So here's the summary for uh, today's talk. I'm going to start off with, with open source. Uh, then I'm going to talk about supply chain, uh, open source supply chain, of course. I'm going to go over some threads that we see. Finally, I'm going to talk about SBOM, SIG store, and confidential computing. So that's the basic uh, agenda for today. So everyone, we're celebrating 25 years of open source, a huge celebration. So let's hear a clap of hands for open source. Yeah, it's so wonderful. And so I was part of the OSI five years ago, and I helped the OSI to celebrate the 20 years of open source. We were part of 40 events worldwide celebrating this together with everyone, including the first edition of FOSS Backstage. And they were so helpful. Uh, celebrating this. And so it's a great pleasure to be back here celebrating 25 years and celebrating five years of FOSS Backstage. It's a wonderful event here uh, for open source in, in Europe and Germany. So open source has won. Open source is pervasive. Open source is everywhere, as you have noticed. And it has become a vital component of a working society. That's why protecting open source is so important. Society depends on it. Um, so let's talk about the supply chain and why uh, the open source supply chain is so important for us to uh, take care of it and to help with security and compliance. So I got this uh, figure from Salsa. How many people have heard of Salsa before? Yes, not many hands. So Salsa, it's really interesting. It's part of the Linux Foundation together with OpenSSF. Uh, and they are a group of people who are defining uh, ways to help with the open source uh, com uh, compliance and security. Uh, uh, um, how to manage this, right? And they have a very interesting if you look at their website, they have a, a very good explanation of how open source supply chain uh, works. So we have several stages. Uh, we have the developer, uh, and he, he develops some code. Uh, that's a source code. Then we have the build stage. We create a package. And finally, you reach the consumer. Uh, and if you look at the dependencies, each one of these has their own supply chain. And each one of these at that level has their own, own supply chain. So it's recursive. And if you look uh, at how this, uh, how each one depends on the other, you'll be scared. Wow, uh, how open source even works, you know? When you uh, use a pack package manager and you fetch all the packages that all your dependencies, and you build that dependency graph, you don't even know what's happening there. And sometimes you have thousands of dependencies. So the fact that it works is amazing, right? And there are several challenges to this, several threads, uh, and each one of them has a, a, a potential thread. So we're going to go over each one of them. So uh, they, are, they are labeled here from A to uh, H. 
And so the first one here that we see, I'm going to uh, give a description, give a famous example of how this threat has happened, and what are some ways to mitigate this uh, threat. So the first one where we see uh, is the number A, where uh, there is an, a change that to the source, to the source repo. And one famous example of this, some researchers, they actually uh, try to commit changes to the Linux kernel on purpose, just as a, a research, <laughs> um, to see what would happen. So, uh, of course, this is terrible. They were doing this as a research, but this can definitely happen. And we see an example as well as uh, like a protest where, where a, a owner of a project, he doesn't like, uh, let's say for example, uh, uh, the war example regarding Russia. So he can change his codes to say, if this code is running in Russia, I'm just going to delete everything. This is called a pro protest where. Um, so one way to mitigate uh, this challenge is to have two person, a two-person review, but you're always going to depend on the original developer of that package. If he or she decides to do damage, you're in trouble. That's why it's really important for you to review those changes, because those committers, those developers, they have the power to define uh, what's going to be uh, as part of this source, right? So let's uh, walk next to the, to the actual source. And this is something that has, uh, so the open source repo might be compromised. This is something actually that happened to the PHP uh, working uh, community. So they self-host their own uh, sources. And that was hacked. Um, and it was introduced to vulnerabilities. And of course, everyone was depending on, on those uh, PHP packages. Uh, uh, they were in trouble. So you really have to protect your sor source code's platform. Uh, so that's number B, uh, letter B. Number C, when you build from a modified source, so you're thinking, you think you're building from uh, uh, the original source, but sometimes you're not. And so this happens with WebMin. Uh, their infrastructure was compromised, so they were actually building something that was not actually the, the true source of, of that. And so a way to protect this is by really identifying the provenance of the source. And we are going to be talking about SIGStore later on on our, on our talk. And this is a way for you to verify the source. Next up. Apologies. So we have a compromise of the build process. So we're going to be building this. Uh, and one famous example is SolarWinds. How many of you have heard of the SolarWinds? That was a big issue uh, because uh, the actual build process was a uh, compromise. Uh, so when you when you actually compromise that, you compromise everything. Uh, and solar, uh, what's interesting about solar winds is that this happened throughout not just a very short period, but it was a very long time. Those hackers uh, they were part of the build infrastructure for so long, and they had so much uh, power over this. And so one way to control this, to, to mitigate this, is to have security controls uh, of the build platform. This is one of the most important parts uh, fr from uh, the supply chain. Uh, now uh, into the letter E. <laughs> That's where we see the, recurs the rec recursive nature of this because every one of those dependencies, uh, they are a potential threat. So one famous example as well 
is when uh, uh, event stream is one of the projects and they had somebody who uh, added a dependency and initially it was innocuous it didn't seem to be something harmful but in fact it was so once it was accepted this package that there was no harm later they changed this package and then it became uh, dangerous, it became a threat. So you always have to check the, pro uh, the provenance of the dependencies. You want to eliminate as much as dependencies as possible so that you can rely, uh, you don't rely too much on this, but we know it's very challenging. So this is, since we have this recursive nature, this is one of the most complex ones of how we can solve this. You always have to check the health and uh, um, the security of each dependency. So now going to the next one, uh, F, is when we have a, a package that was modified. Uh, the, the, it was uploaded, another package. And so one example was CodeCov. Uh, the credentials were leaked and the hackers, they uploaded a malicious uh, package. So you always want to check the provenance of those artifacts as well. And going to the next one here, again, uh, a compromised package repo. Uh, there was a, a famous research as well where they were attacking, they were studying attacks on package mirrors and how this can affect um, your, your supply chain. So again, you have to check the provenance of all artifacts. And I'll be talking about SIGSOR and how that's important as well. And finally, we're going to, uh, to, to the letter H. Again, compromising the package repo, we have one famous example, it's the browser, uh, browser refi type of squatting. So you, you enter a name that's very similar, but it's not actually pointing to that package, and there's really no way for you to solve this. Um, you have to be careful where are you downloading uh, those packages. Um, so th and that's a way for you to, to, to solve this. So as you can see, there are several threads in the supply chain, and uh, recently, S-Bombs have, have gained a lot of interest to solve those supply chain issues. And in fact, uh, especially after Log4j, uh, the White House in the US and also in Europe, uh, they have uh, really given emphasis to the use of S-bombs. And this in the US, this is going to be mandatory uh, in, in the near future you actually have to pro provide S-bombs. So what's exactly S-bombs? Uh, they are metadata about uh, how you build your software, what are all the, the dependencies. We have, uh, as a part of the metadata, we have the name of the, the dependency, the version number, the lessons, the offers, unique ID, and there are several formats that uh, are, are part of S-bombs. So one of them is uh, is PDX from the Linux Foundation, Cyclone DX from o OWASP, and also Suites. And so S-bombs, they're really important, not only in terms of security, but also in terms of uh, compliance. And what, what do you want is to have S-bombs in each one of those stages, an S-bomb for the source, S-bomb for the builds and S-bomb for the package so that you have a, a full control over the supply chain and you know exactly where uh, is the issue. And also, ideally, you, you will reach a point where each dependency also has S-bombs so that you have a better control over that. So you can, you can imagine that this can get quite complex. Uh, it's almost big data, right? You have so many ass pumps everywhere and you have to learn how to manage that, especially if you have thousands of dependencies. 
So uh, let's, uh, we did look at the supply chain, uh, but there was one last step that we didn't analyze, which was the deployments. And here we can see one of the issues uh, when we deploy something that has a vulnerabil vulnerability, right? And how S-Pumps can help that. S-Pumps allows you to evaluate if you're using something that's compromised, something that has a bug or an issue. So you, you can check your S-Pump, you can check a database of CVEs. Also, there, there's a, a big issue around false positives. So that's why you want to use VAX as well. This is a, a new uh, standard. And you have to patch that uh, constantly. If there's an issue that happens, you, you're always checking, you're always monitoring this. And once you find an issue, you have to patch and solve that or just take it down before hackers can get a hold of this, right? Now we're going to talk a bit more about SIGSTOR. So we already covered S-Pumps and how are S-Pumps related to SIGSTOR. So SIGSTOR uh, is relatively new. It's also part of the Linux Foundation. Um, it allows developers to sign artifacts. It allows you to sign release files, container images, binaries, and even S-Pumps. And it allows developers to verify if those are authentic. And what's interesting about this is that you can actually build an S-Pump on each one uh, of these stages on the supply chain and sign that to make sure that the S-Pump uh, was really created uh, and, and at that stage, and it was you that created that, or, or somebody that you trust. And what's interesting about SIGSOR is that it's a, it has a keyless approach. You don't use keys. Uh, it's really challenging for open source projects because you don't want to, want, you don't want to manage several keys. Developers may come and leave by creating something that's keyless that you use the uh, open ID, uh, OIDC, you can sign very easily uh, any artifacts just with your open ID. And that's fantastic. Um, so that was the insights behind SIGSTOR. And this will help uh, when we talked about the threads, each, mm -hmm, when we talked about the threads, each one of them, uh, each, at each stage, um, there were several um, potential threads because you didn't know the provenance of those artifacts. But by using SIGSTOR, you're going to have uh, this, this assurance, right? And this is really important. Oh, and of course, you would like to have S-bombs uh, and uh, those signed S-bombs attached uh, to your dependencies as well. Uh, this would be an ideal world. Uh, so let's uh, take a more careful look now at deployments. We looked uh, at the whole supply chain, but the, the last day here, the last mile, I think it's really important for us to go a little bit over this. So what's actually a modern deployment today? What do you have for, uh, for su successful deployments? So it's not just about your application. There are several layers you have to worry about. You have to worry about the user space. Uh, usually you're using a container, uh, probably, most likely, or maybe not. But even so, you're going to have an operating system behind this uh, Linux, most likely. And you have different layers. Sounds good, right? No problem. OK. Oh, wait. You don't have to worry about your open source, your application, your supply chain there, and all its dependencies. Now you have to worry about all the supply chain issues on the user space, on the kernel, on the bootloader, on the hypervisor, on the firmware, the BIOS. Wow, 
it just explodes. <laughs> so it gets more and more complex. So are you going to generate an S-bomb? Are you going to be signing all this across the whole spectrum, across all layers? It gets more and more complex. But that's what you have to do, right? So, uh, and each, again, each one of these is a potential threat where you have to secure this. There is one emerging technology that's happening. It's called confidential computing. How many of you have heard of this? Okay, just a few hands. But confidential computing is really exciting. It's something uh, when I first heard about it, I was like, wow, this actually works. So what confidential computing is, is doing actually, so you have here all the layers from the application all the way to the CPU and we just remove all those layers. And the application talks directly to the CPU. Uh, even if you're using a compromised operating system, even so, your code and your data is still secure. And when I first heard about that, I was like, wow, how is that possible? So you can actually run your application in a totally compromised cloud infrastructure and still you can assure that your application, your code, your data is secure. That's just amazing. And how does that work? So uh, we drastically, re uh, confidential computing drastically reduces the attack surface. All your application has to do is to trust the CPU because you, got, you have to trust something, right? And the CPU is like the last layer. If you can't trust the CPU then, Oops, um, and you, it, this is a, a, a point where you really try to apply zero trust. You don't trust anyone. You don't trust your host, your cloud service provider. You don't trust other workloads uh, running in the same cloud infrastructure. You don't even trust the admins or even the hackers, of course, uh, the hackers who break into your system. Uh, even if they do break, you don't want to have them uh, gain access to your code and, and data. So, confidential, how does it work? How confidential computing works? The confidential, I'm going to read this because the Confidential Computing Consortium, which I'm part of, has spent, it's made by 40 company members, and they spent one year working on this definition and another year to add this word here, attested. So let me read this very carefully to be sure that I'm not going to miss it. So confidential computing protects data in use by performing computation in a hardware-based, attested, trusted execution environment, TEE. These secure and isolated environments prevents unauthorized access or modification of code and data while in use. So let's go over uh, the data protections that uh, we have. So everyone knows here about protecting data at rest in storage. This is when your hard drive is encrypted or when you save an image or a file to, uh, to the cloud and it's encrypted, right? Even if somebody were to gain access to that server, they will not be able to see what's in, what are those uh, data in storage because it's encrypted. Also protecting uh, data in transit. This is very common nowadays with HTTPS. All traffic um, going between your browser or the server or between servers, uh, services, they're all encrypted. If somebody were to gain access to that uh, data traffic, they wouldn't be able to make sense of it because it's fully encrypted. And we apply the same idea here to protecting data in use. So at the CPU level, at the, uh, at the memory level, this is the last stage where you're going to protect your data. Your data is encrypted in memory. Even if somebody were to gain access to your server, to to the operating system, compromise your whole cloud infrastructure, if they do a memory dump, they will not be able to see that data because it's encrypted. Just like your hard drive, just like uh, the, data, the HTTPS data that's flowing between your browser and the server, 
that data is secure. So it's a special mechanism by the CPU, and these are becoming very common nowadays. Um, Intel has SGX and TDX, ARM has the CCA, the Conflict Computing Architecture, and uh, AMD has SEV. These are becoming more and more common in the clouds. Uh, it's not very popular yet, but this will soon explode. And so this is really interesting. This is where it can really help on the supply chain. Whoops, sorry. So this is really interesting because uh, your application only has to trust the CPU. You eliminate all the layers between that. And so in other words, you eliminate, eliminate all the supply chain issues that you have between the application and the CPU. There's also an, an attestation process where uh, it's called remote attestation, where you can actually verify that this TE, this CPU, is authentic. So everything signed, uh, every, you can verify, you can attest everything. This is like the maximum security. Uh, ever. Uh, so inter interesting enough, you can actually have an S bomb associated with your application. You can have an attestation process, making sure that your TE uh, is authentic, is uh, by Intel SGX or AMD or whatever. And you can use CoSign uh, as part of SIG store for everywhere. So you're going, you know exactly what you're running, all your dependencies, you uh, eliminated, eliminated uh, a lot of the supply chain from other layers as well. Everything signed, everything is attested, everything is much more secure using a combination of Confidential Computing, SIG Store, and s -Bomb. So that's like the the ultimate dream, right? <laughs> uh, and not only that, uh, nowadays, you're not, um, your application is not isolated. Your application talks with other applications uh, as part of uh, services. So not only that, you can have policies to uh, make sure that you're connecting only to applications that provide those assurances. Uh, they have those attestations uh, from the CPUs. They have uh, attestations from cosign as well, and has an S bomb. And so you can you can make sure you can have greater assurances. There are you're only connecting to applications that uh, are secure, right? Uh, so that's the the dream. Um, so we're celebrating 25 years of open source. Uh, securing the open source supply chain is really key to a working society. It's a huge responsibility for all of us. By working together, we can really make it happen. And these technologies can really help everyone, not just us on the technology, working with technology, working with open source today. But everyone, the whole society depends on this. So I would like to invite you to learn a bit more about this and about these technologies, about how we can combine those technologies, as bombs, SIG store, Confidential Computing, and so much more. So it's really uh, an excitement, exciting moment for us and it's really a big sense of responsibility. We have to do this. So thank you very much. Uh, I welcome you to join OC3. It's a conference that it's being organized by actually a German company around confidential computing, and it's happening online. If you want to join this, you can access oc3.dev. It's happening um, the 15th. Uh, the day after tomorrow. And also, on the 15th, we're going to have the ORT Community Day happening here as well, being organized by Thomas, uh, 
uh, around uh, open source review toolkits and the supply chain, you're welcome to join us. So thank you very much, and it was a pleasure to be here. <laughs> and I'm open to questions, if we still have some time. My curiosity is on how does that uh, CPU runs that application? Will it be built specific to that application, handle that application, or? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So uh, there are several uh, software that help you with that. I'm actually part of a, a project called Anarchs. It's open source. It's part of the Computational Computing Consortium from the Linux Foundation. And uh, we use WebAssembly to, on the server side, for you to use your application, you can uh, compile that to WebAssembly, which is a bytecode format, and this will run across different architectures. So you run across Intel, uh, AMD, and it work easily well. You don't have to change your application for it to work. You can just use it. Uh, Confidential computing is really complex. You have to know about cryptography, uh, all the different models, uh, the architectures. So you can use some tools to help with that, uh, so you don't ha to abstract that level. But it's very, very cutting edge. Uh, you, yeah, you have to customize your application for each different CPU to take advantage of that, but you do have some middleware uh, uh, software to help abstract those challenges, yeah. Because what's happening is you're, you're not interacting with the operating system anymore. Your application is talking directly with the CPU. Uh, you're not doing any syscalls. Uh, so it's very challenging indeed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Uh, thank you for, for the very comprehensive talk. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering about, so, I mean, over there, like I said, zero trust, where it seems like, for me, we're just putting all of our trust in the CPU and that those um, trusted computing modules will work. Mm -hmm. um, and we know, like, I think, like, that there's also, like, they're not completely, like, secure. They're susceptible, like, some, some for example, to side channel attacks and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, is that really the better model where, as, as opposed to just assuming that you can't trust anything outside your application and Building, building that into your security? Yeah, so zero trust is about trying to eliminate as much as possible dependencies or access, not only to humans, but also to software, right? With, um, with computational computing, we eliminate a lot of layers. We don't have to depend on the operating system or any, any of the, those layers until the CPU. CPU is like the last, <laughs> we have to trust s something, right? And the CPU is the, the last phase. But the CPU has this process, uh, the attestation, the remote attestation, and you, and you can actually verify uh, cryptographically that you are using uh, a CPU that provides confidential computing. Um, there's no other way around it. But, did, did I answer your question? I mean, my question is specifically, like, is it better to have this sort of, like, trusting one thing that's really secure approach or distributing our trust across many things that are, um, yeah, less secure maybe overall, but we know that, like, we can trust them less and we operate with that assumption that we cannot fully trust them. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the situation. Um, I think having um, distributed architectures are always very challenging, right? You're going to distribute that trust uh, assurances. I would say a more centralized uh, model is a, a more secure one. But it depends on the situation, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the presentation. So how is the authenticity of the signature verified? With which method? 
And which one? Cosine, the CPU. Um, <laughs> uh, excuse me? Six door. Oh, the yeah. six door. Yes. Um, so, uh, this is something relatively new to me. Uh, I've been studying for two weeks since I, I joined this role, right? But basically, um, it tries to abstract everything. Uh, Cosign is going to do everything for you. From the developer's perspective, you're just, you just have to use the open ID, and that, uh, that creates, uh, um, that proves that you signed that. Now, the, the behind the scenes, this is a good question. I still have to learn. <laughs> but yes, uh, behind the scenes, they use keys uh, to, to have the, the pub public, and pi uh, public and private keys to handle everything. It's very complex, and it's a pretty interesting project. A lot of uh, organizations are involved with uh, cosign and six or it's really worth uh, studying that more. And I have a lot to learn as well. <laughs> how it's, yes, if you go to sigstore.dev, there's a whole bunch of documentation there as well. It's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody. And thank you so much, Nick, thank for you. teaching <laughs> us about confidential computing. <laughs>